when you go out looking for morels, I mean, you have morels on the mind, but um, there are other mushrooms, other spring mushrooms out there that you may stumble upon. So we're going to, we're going to uh, review some of those before uh, John comes up and we get into the heavy duty morel presentation. So um, I'm going to start off here. So, okay, you can't wait to get out in the woods. You go out there, you're, you're early. I mean, maybe next week. Um, you might come across this mushroom, which is the scarlet cup mushroom, Sarcosypha austriaca. That's what we have in our area. Um, a lot of your books will call it Sarco Sarcosypha coccinea, but that is only available in the Northwest garlic cup. So the scarlet cup is one of the cup fungi, um, um, it's an ascomycete. Um, anyway, what's cool about this mushroom is probably the, the first mushroom that fruits in, in the spring. So also, um, if you're really lucky, you might come across something like this. What you're seeing is a downed aspen log with a nice, beautiful bunch of oyster mushrooms. So um, <clears throat> 30 years ago, and even less than that, um, when we, uh, oyster mushrooms were all in our area called Pleurotus ostriatus. But what is happening in mycology today is that they are breaking species up into, into um, bigger groups. And this is with DNA sequencing and so forth. But the ones that you find in, um, in the spring here on the aspen are Pleurotus uh, populinus. So they grow on the genus populus, and that would include aspens and, and cottonwoods. So often they're on downed logs. Um, sometimes you might find one on an upright like this. Nice, beautiful bunch. And let's see if I can uh, get my pointer going here. Is this it? Um, okay. So looky here. Here's look at these little guys here. There's a bunch of them, these little bugs. And you will often see these on your oyster mushrooms. We'll take a closer look at that uh, coming up here. So this is Pleurotus uh, populinus. The other two are Pleurotus ostriatus and Pleurotus pulmonarius. So uh, these, the um, the ostriatus, um, that's kind of the classic uh, oyster mushroom, um, is usually in the fall and it like is on hardwoods. It likes to occur on, um, on oaks. And then uh, the Pleurotus pulmonarius um, is more in the starts in the summer, maybe goes into um, early, early fall. And so uh, they tend to be smaller, a little, they're, they're very white compared to the other ones. And um, so let's take a closer look. Before I do that, though, I've, I'm just reminded here that oyster mushrooms are a natural source of lovastatin. Lovastatin, some of you may be taking this medication, is one of the largest uh, selling drugs in in the U.S. It's a cholesterol-lowering lowering drugs, and it's in oyster mushroom. And then another thing about uh, the oyster mushrooms is that they're the easiest ones to grow at home, so they're you can you can cultivate them real easily. All right, now let's take a closer look. Um, so um, you know you can get different colors of the cap. Like I said, the pulmonarius is tends to be more white than the others. Um, so the, the one that we find in the spring on the aspen uh, 
as you saw in the, the first slide, it tends to be kind of whitish to yellowish, maybe a little bit tan. Okay, so oyster mushrooms, one thing to note on oyster mushrooms, they have a lateral stem. They, they are always growing on wood. They have gills that are decurrent, and that term means that they are they are running down the stem and here all, almost all the way to where it attaches to the wood. If you did a spore print, you would get a white. Sometimes you can even get a pale lilac. And then the, uh, the Pleurotus populinus, uh, more than the others, tends to have this wonderful uh, anise uh, licorice kind of uh, aroma to it. And if you take if you took a nibble of it and tasted it, it would be mild in taste. Okay. And here's that little bug. So that bug is called a pleasing fungus beetle. And there are, believe it, there are hundreds of pleasing fungus beetles. And this particular species specializes in oyster mushrooms. So, so that's, that's one sign that you have an oyster mushroom. You see that little black body with an orange, orange head on it. Okay, and what's this? Whoa, this is um, a nematode worm. So we saw, the, um, we saw that beetle eating the, eating the oyster, but the oyster actually is carnivorous. It eats um, nematode worms. Um, so this is uh, the hyphae, and they have little bulbs on here that that are sticky, and they have a neurotoxin on it, and they kill the the worm almost immediately and turn it into a proteinaceous slurry that the uh, gives nourishment to the um, the oyster mushroom. Okay, what's next? Oh, we have. We have a newcomer. Uh, this is uh, the golden oyster, which uh, has recently appeared in the last five to 10 years, mostly since the last five years. Um, let's see if I can get rid of that. Okay, the golden oyster. So uh, you probably will be finding these. They are becoming more and more common. And you can see if you look at these, well, I mean, the color, uh, they have a little umbilicus in the in the top there and they tend to grow from they're clustered and tend to grow from a common common base and they are a very good very good edible they are in fact an invasive species so um we don't know what that's what that's going to mean uh to the other species of pleurotus in our area but we'll find out but if you do find them, they are excellent, excellent edible, as are the other the other species of oysters. All right. So you're out looking for morels and you're not finding any morels and you're about to, to give up. And then if you're out for very long, you will almost certainly run into some of these big fleshy polypore mushrooms uh, called the dryad saddle or pheasant back mushrooms. And uh, <clears throat> they'll often, you know, like, well, you'll find out about one of the places for morel mushrooms is around, you know, elm trees. So these, uh, the pheasant backs tend to grow on elm trees that are like over the hill for finding, finding morels. As you can see here, so there's no bark left on this tree. It's just sloughed off. So this is a big polypore mushroom. It's one, you know, it's, um, let's look at another one here. So this could be like 12 inches across here. And uh, if you look at the pores, so this polypore has some of the largest pores that you're going to see on a, on a polypore. And then these pores are openings to tubes that that are make up the polypore, and not visible here, but it, but um, the base of the uh, pheasant back ha is black. Okay, and then there's something else that's um, 
that's really interesting about this mushroom, and that is its scent. And it has the scent of watermelon or watermelon rind. It is edible. A lot of people are eating these nowadays. I mean, when you go out morel hunting, you find a lot of these that have been harvested. You never saw that before, and that's because everybody's out looking for mushrooms now. But in terms of edibility, this one, uh, unfortunately, very often is going to be too tough to eat. And um, if you get your knife, and if you can find one that your knife just easily slices through it, you may have one that's good to eat. But one of the better indicators if it's going to be a good edible is, is the pores. So if you find one that the pores have not gotten large, they're just little tiny pores, those tend to be the most tender and, and edible. Okay, you're out looking for morels, and you may come across uh, some of these, and you think, wow, man, there's some, uh, wow, we got some black trumpets, but no, we, do, we don't have black trumpets in the spring. They're only in the fall, and these are uh, the devil's urn, craterellus urnula, and they they tend to grow on uh, sticks, like you see here, sometimes on berry, on wood or buried wood. And uh, they are listed as an edible mushroom in Michael Quo's uh, 100 Edible Mushrooms. And he doesn't rate them very highly, but, um, but Tom, Tom Volk, uh, the late Tom Volk tells us that if you stuff them with crab and breadcrumbs, they are excellent. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, uh, so here we are looking for morels, and you may come across a false morel. So this, the Gyromitra brunia, I'll sometimes call the elephant here. This is the most common one that, at least in my experience, that you find around in morel areas. There's there's a number of other um, false morels that uh, I think that John will be getting into some of those. False morel and something really important on these false morels, if you cut them open, they are not hollow on the inside, and I'm sure John will get into that when he talks about morels. Okay, and here's another one you might run into. This is a, a, the veined cup fungus. This, this is, could be about five inches across. Uh, it roughly has some veins in it. This one doesn't look too veined. But um, anyway, check this out. It is in the family Marchalaceae. So it is related to the mor morels. It tastes like, I mean, it smells like morels and it is edible and tastes like morels. But we do not recommend uh, eating this because there is another cup fungus um, that is almost identical. So this one is dis Discoitis venosa and then this, most of your books will have this listed as dis. Desina uh, perlata. Now it has a new name, Gyromitra, which, as you recall, there's Gyromitra again in the false morels. So um, the Gyromitras, um, we do not recommend them because they are uh, they are toxic. They have this um, toxin called monomethylhydrazine, which is the the rocket fuel toxin. It landed. That substance landed the lunar module on the moon, believe it or not. And let's go. Okay, so so if you were really determined and you wanted to try to identify this as um, the edible one, you could do a uh, use your microscope, and you see the spores are really pretty pretty different. And here here's spores that are in. In a sack that's called the ascus, and so uh, we have um, the cup fungi are are uh, in the the big group called ascomyces, the sac fungi, and here's some more cup fungi that that you 
that you can find when you're looking for morels. And these are called the common brown cup, Pazaiza batio confusa. It has a new name now, uh, Pazaiza phylogena. And um, Roger Phillips says it's edible, but this, again, we do not recommend eating this because uh, there's a lot of different brown cup mushrooms and they're really difficult to identify. You need a, you need a microscope really. Um, and then there's, so this, the one in the spring is generally bad, the, the phylogen and the one in the fall later on is Pazaiza badia. All right, and then we come to these beautiful mushrooms that uh, often, uh, when you when you're looking for elm trees, you will find an elm tree that has some of these. Uh, they're they're the uh, velvet foot mushrooms, Flamulina of Lutopes. A lot of times they're growing out from under the bark. You can see they have this uh, velvety black, brownish black uh, stem on it, and here you see it again here. But notice the young ones, it, it takes a while for it to, uh, to get to entirely black velvet on it. So anyway, this, this is a really good edible mushroom. It, has a, it actually tastes sweet in my experience. But we, uh, this is not a beginner's mushroom, and we advise that you approach this with extreme caution. And the reason is... But before I do that, I'll just say here's another uh, view of it. You often find it uh, looking like this, slimy, viscous. And then when it's viscous like this, a lot of times you may get a bunch of dirty debris on it, which kind of messes it up. But so you need to be cautious because there is another mushroom that looks uh, dangerously similar which happens to be the uh, deadly gallerina mushroom. So you can see the similarity. Uh, it doesn't have, uh, you know, it doesn't have this really prominent black velvet on it, but it is a little brown here. Uh, so let's, let's explore this a little further here. So, okay, here's your velvet foot. So you can see a little bit of uh, velvet right there. Um, so, uh, but you, if you look closely, uh, you will not see, there's no ring, okay? But this is a deadly gallerina. It has a ring. Uh, the caps look pretty similar. So this is about, they're about the size of a, of a quarter. Um, the gills look pretty similar, and they both grow on wood. We we saw one growing out of uh, an elm tree. The uh, the gallerinas tend to tend also they grow on wood, but they tend to grow on wood that's more rotten and often um, mossy. So, the big thing that you need to look for is do a spore print because the uh, the edible Flamulina of Lutopes has a white spore print. The deadly Gallerina has a brown spore print. Okay, so do that spore print. This is always a good, good practice. Okay, here is another common one that you may find uh, growing on sticks. This is another polypore, and it also has really pretty, pretty large pores. So this is only maybe two inches, one to two inches across, and it has a, a lateral stem that's kidney-shaped, and um, it's got a new name. All of your older books will call it polyporous or polyporous alveolaris. Now is neofavalous alveolaris, the hex hexagonal pored polypore. All right, and here is yet another polypore. Now this one, looks kind of similar, but it has a central stem. It's called the spring polypore. There's another similar one called the winter polypore. Um, but this one has, has large, very large pores, and it also has 
a ring of uh, hairs around the, the circumference. Okay. And you, you can sometimes uh, come across uh, some mica caps. These are inky caps, and they are edible. If you, if you find them when they're just right and young, they can be okay to eat. They're pre they can be pretty good. They get their name because uh, you can see a little bit kind of like a frosting, a little bit of a frosting. I don't know if it's very prominent, but if you get it in the sunlight and kind of move it around, you'll see little glistening speckles that that's where it gets his name, the black, I mean, the Mikey, mica inky cap. But if you take these home and you don't do something with them right away, you will have a mass of black goo on your in your refrigerator or wherever okay i think we're getting we're getting there okay and here's one uh called the early spring pink gill in Taloma. and uh uh i have found these when looking for morels they have a pointy top on them and then the genus in um is the one of the main characteristics is they have really pretty pink spores so you can maybe get a little bit of a pinkish tint here but uh most of the uh entolomas are po are po poisonous and probably this one is uh, probably poisonous too there's there's only one entoloma that um that most people eat and that's the aborted entoloma which we are we affectionately called stump dumplings and you may we, you'll be seeing those in the in the fall okay i think uh, oh one okay here's the last one yes you may come across a deer or the deer or fawn mushroom this is a real common mushroom it's a real it's an easy one to learn and um you can see it grows on wood and it's another one that has pink pink spores and you can kind of see a pinkish tint here and here the color of the cap is kind of grayish brown but another really key feature on this is that the gills are free that means they're not attached to the stem so here you can see a white band that separates the gills from the from the stem. Okay, so that those are the mushrooms you may come across when you uh, <laughs> when you're looking for morels. The question was with was, was were the scarlet caps are they edible? And the response is that they are so small that they likely would not be. But they're probably not poisonous. So the question was, we've had all these um, uh, downed trees. So are we going to be finding mushrooms on those downed trees that just recently happened? And I said, probably not not right away. It's going to take a while, you know, maybe next year. Um, like the uh, the down, you know, if you got a bunch of downed aspens, um, you know, come back in a year or so and maybe. But they do need to be be dead. Uh, would you like me to uh, uh, tell you what questions are in the chat, John? Yes. Uh, do both wild and cultivated oysters contain lovastatin? And I don't know if your audience can hear these questions either, so you might want to repeat it to them. Yeah, okay. So the question was about lovastatin, that um, that cholesterol-lowering drug. Um, do all oysters have those I, I i think so i'm not absolutely sure but i'm pretty sure and you know there have been studies of you know feeding it to rats i think they actually some athletic team they really um chowed down on a bunch of oysters and it lowered their cholesterol and our um rick What's the best way to clean bugs from oyster mushrooms? <laughs> oh, well, those those bugs, those little. Well, repeat the question, Ron. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, okay. Audience yeah. In the room so, can how hear about how do you clean those bugs off of there? And those 
I mean, the bugs, I'm assuming we're talking about those pleasing beetles and those come off real easy. They don't, you know, um, there, you know, there, maybe there's going to be some other ones in there, but that's, that's the main one. And they come off pretty easy though. In fact, they'll fly away. If you have them in your house, they will be flying around. And then uh, Julie Close asks, are rectangular polypores edible? Are rectangular polypores edible? Oh, or hexagonal uh, poured polypores? Uh, they're chewable. <laughs> <laughs> you can use them like chewing gum <laughs> because they're, they are tough and leathery. But, you know, they gotta, I think the taste is probably pretty good. I'm uh, not John, I'm Peter Martinaco. I'm your current president instead of these past presidents. So I guess I'm not quite as old as they are. There's a morel. There's some other morels. These are a little bit older morels, a little more mature than the last one. And they are Minnesota state mushroom. We were the first state to have a state mushroom. Now there's a bunch of copycats uh, that are coming along. They've, they've been voting on them lately here. Uh, but we kind of, if they copy us with the morels, they're just really copying us. So let's talk about going out and looking for morels or any kind of mushrooms. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, we want to be wearing you know, comfortable shoes and boots. Uh, we like, to, I like to carry a walking stick, partly because I'm old, but uh, it, it helps uh, push aside the understory so you can see what you want to see. We, we had a former president, his, his favorite morel hunting stick was a hot stick because he found he could push aside the, the, under underbrush and stuff to see uh, see the morels more easily. Want to make sure that uh, you're able to uh, know to know where you're where you are. So a compass, GPS, or familiarity. Now a lot of the areas that you might be morel hunting aren't necessarily really big. So you might not get lost, but if you go down to places like uh, uh, the Whitewater State Forest and stuff, uh, uh, you can get pretty turned around there in the valleys and it's a long walk out. So uh, I've, I've experienced the long walk out, not because, in this case, not because I got lost, but because I walked a long ways in. Now, typically when we're collecting mushrooms, we really don't want ideally to use a plastic bag or a plastic container that's sealed. We want our mushrooms to have some ventilation uh, because mushrooms are mostly water. And if, if you put them in a plastic bag, you know, like a grocery bag, and then carry them around in warm weather for the day, uh, you're going to end up with kind of spoiled mushrooms. They're going to they're gonna deteriorate pretty rapidly. Uh, and even if you put them in a bag or a basket, uh, they can still deteriorate even over the course of a warm day. So uh, you need to be mindful of that. Uh, a lot of people like mesh bags. Uh, one of the reasoning is, is that you're you're not only giving them ventilation, but you're giving the, the morels a chance to spread their spores around. Uh, this is, uh, while, it, while it sounds really good, and I, I sure wouldn't uh, uh, argue against it, uh, there's really not been any good scientific uh, research ever done that that really affects anything, but, uh, we can always hope that uh, that we'll spread something good around. I personally prefer a basket uh, because it allows you to spread the mushrooms out. 
uh, a little bit. And, uh, you know, a, a wicker basket allows the spores to get out as well. And I find that the mesh bags, they want to catch on every little bramble and bush and raspberry and blackberry and prickly ash, which prickly ashes are, well, we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, things like that. Uh, so mesh bags are, I find them frustrating. I like to have a knife, uh, so I cut the morels uh, off. Now, is there any, there's this uh, hotly debated question about whether you're damaging the morel mycelium by pulling the morel out, morel out and cutting it off. I, I uh, prefer cutting them off rather than pulling them out and then trimming them. Uh, in the case of other mushrooms, I do it the other way. Uh, I don't think there's any clear uh, evidence in the case of morels that it really, again, matters uh, which way you do it. Uh, sometimes I, uh, maybe this is uh, me, some meanness in me. I, I like to cut them off and leave the stumps <laughs> for other people to find so that they know that they were there too late. So that that's a that's a personal affliction, you know, of 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 saying, ah, yeah, yeah, nah, nah. Anyway, uh, it's a good idea if you're out for a for a fair bit of time to bring along some water and snacks. It can get kind of warm uh, morel hunting, uh, so uh, you can have some pretty warm weather. It's not quite as warm as it is when you're chanterelle hunting, but uh, it can still get pretty warm and, and your body in the spring isn't quite used to all that warm weather yet. Now it's important, I want to, I want to talk about ticks. Ticks are really uh, something that we need to be concerned about here in Minnesota. The And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but we need to talk about tick prevention. Uh, and and safety because it it can be a really serious problem. Uh, some people like to carry binoculars because a lot of times you're looking. You know, one of the things you're looking for is dead uh, elm trees is one of the common things that you look for. And sometimes you can see them. You know, you say, "Oh, is that a el dead elm tree over there?" And having a pair of binoculars. Uh, could save you a long walk. So uh, for something that isn't an elm tree, and particularly right now, we're finding more and more dead ash trees in the woods, which aren't quite so productive at all. So now, as far as tick, uh, tick prevention, it says spray your clothes with permethrin, check your gear, footwear, you know, get your start park pass if you're hunting in a state park. Uh, you know, we you can scout small wood lots uh, in public areas, local parks we're picking, scout private land and ask people permission. Uh, you know, and, and people give you permission if they don't have somebody else that's already uh, got dibs on on their morels, but uh, it's a good idea to do. And uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll be able to say, well, maybe I can come back and look for other mushrooms later because there's lots of people who pick morels that aren't familiar with other types of edible mushrooms. And there's lots of good mushrooms later in the season. Now, Here's 16 tick-borne diseases in the United States. That's a big list, and this is not current. There's more. There's more. So, uh, of course, we're most familiar with Lyme's disease, and the prevalence of Lyme's disease is just becoming more and more common all the time. So 
And quite honestly, it's not even showing Lyme's disease on this list. But we all know that it's it's here and it and the numbers of cases in Minnesota continue to go up all the time. And what we were talking about, I don't know how many of you know listening or here that are familiar with permethrin. Uh, permethrin is a is a uh, insecticide that uh, that you don't put on yourself. You put it on your clothes and you put it on your gear. And once it's dried, it is sticks to your clothes and doesn't come off. So it's from that standpoint, it's it's safe uh, for us to to you know wear around. And it uh, for insects and in the case of ticks, arachnids, uh, it is a nerve toxin. And it comes from a natural source. It, the permethrin is a it grow you know is naturally in chrysanthemums. And so it's a chemical that, that does occur in nature. Uh, you can buy it uh, at any sporting goods area. You need you look for it. It says permethrin on it. It'll say for treating camping gear and stuff like that. You can get it online. I know people that buy it in concentrate and then just to make it cheaper to thin it down. Uh, and I haven't checked lately, but there are two manufacturers in the United States that are uh, licensed to you to to treat clothing with permethrin, and they sell clothing that's treated. One of the manufacturers is called Insect Shield, and they have pre-treated clothes that you can buy. Uh, which most of those I find to be not really suited for mushroom hunting or foraging because they're kind of lightweight. They're more for keeping the mosquitoes off you. But Insect Shield, uh, as, of, as of a few years ago, you could send them your clothes and they would treat them and send them back to you. Now, the advantage of this is usually so clothes that you treat yourself, they say they need to be retreated every six weeks or so, or after three washings. Uh, the insect shield uh, clothes say that they are good for 70 washings. And there is, they don't talk about a time limit. I did do this a few years back, and I have found that while they're not as effective as they once were, they're still pretty effective. So uh, I really like that. Yes. You want to store your clothes outside or in a garage. Super toxic to cats. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing, uh, one comment that Kathy just made is that when you treat, and it tells you right on the on the stuff that when you treat your clothes, that that permethrin is can be very toxic to cats. And so while while you're treating them and while they're drying, it is very important to to not allow cats to be exposed to it. Uh, they claim once it is dry, that it is. Again, it it's binds to the fabric and the clothes and is no longer uh, toxic to cats. And I I haven't found any bad effects with my cats, and and they do have access to my clothes on occasion. They don't sleep on them, but anything like that. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of other uh, tick-borne diseases. Uh, you know, the good news is most of them are rare. Uh, you know, anaplasma, ichoriosis uh, is uh, are, are ones that we do see around here some. Uh, Rocky mounted spotted fever is becoming more common, but it's still pretty uncommon uh, here. But I, I can tell you, 
when you get home, whether you treat your clothes or not, you want to check yourself. You want to make sure that you're not harboring any ticks. A lot of times you may want to take your clothes and when you take them off, throw them in the dryer and because that'll kill the ticks. The heat from the dryer will kill the ticks. Uh, we have a, a good friend who's a longtime member of the club. He contracted Lyme's disease and he didn't know he got it. And several years later, it started giving him terrible symptoms that he is still not recovered from where he can, when they were trying to figure out what exactly was wrong with him, they couldn't figure it out because it wasn't, it was literally years after he thinks he was bitten by a tick and his knees and joints swelled and became so painful, he ended up having to be hospitalized because he couldn't walk. Uh, he becomes, to this day, easily you know, tired, lots of uh, fatigue and stuff like that. And uh, it's been a, it's been a real struggle for him. And, and he's a super healthy guy otherwise. And uh, it just, uh, it's really knocked him for a loop. And he's not the only one that I've uh, known that has had really bad consequences from chronic uh Lyme's disease, it can be treated if you catch it early enough, if you know you've been bitten and think you may have been exposed. Uh, it can be treated successfully with, that, with not too harsh antibiotics pretty much right away. So something uh, that you don't want to mess around with. It's, it's, a, it's a bad situation. And some of these, while fortunately very rare, are have have mortality rates. Lyme's disease doesn't usually uh, kill you right away. So, so again, after you're out, some people like to keep uh, activity logs so you can kind of keep track of when you found them, maybe where. Uh, Probably don't want to share that with other people uh, where you found them. But, uh, and you want to make sure that you take care of your morels. You know, make sure they're not, you know, crushed or packed. You want to refrigerate them. If they're in good condition, you can easily keep morels for a couple of weeks uh, in the refrigerator. If they were in good condition when you picked them, uh, I like to put them in a bowl and put a damp uh, dish towel over them in the refrigerator and make sure the dish towel stays relatively damp. And as long as they haven't been getting moldy or anything, they, they will keep surprisingly well. Now, uh, the other things you can do with them uh, is to help preserve them is you can cook them right away and then they can keep perhaps a little better in the refrigerator. Uh, they'll keep for a while that way, but don't forget them in there because they will spoil. Uh, you could dry them, uh, which is an excellent way of preserving them uh, as well. They're one of, one, of, one of the best mushrooms out there for, for drying, uh, that they dry very well and reconstitute quite well. Uh, also, some people take and... Uh, and freeze them, uh, which is something I like to do. Uh, I take and, and park and cook them, trying to get most of the moisture out, and, uh, and then freeze them uh, that way, vacuum pack them and, and freeze them. And they keep, they keep really nice that way and, and stuff like that. And sometimes I might even take them, instead of just letting the water that goes into the pan and let, instead of just letting it cook off, I might pour it off and save it as like a mushroom broth. So there's a couple of different ways you can do things. Oh yeah, look at that, oh, here they come. And the littlest ticks of those bunch can be the size of a period at the end of a sentence. 
So you really got to make sure that if you think you got bit, don't don't uh, uh, mess around. And unfortunately, to this day, the tick uh, tests for Lyme's disease are not super reliable. I mean, once one, once you've been very much infected for a, a long time, then a lot of times they can tell, but kind of by that time, it's a little too late. So and here they're showing a wood tick and here's deer ticks. So you might be familiar with wood ticks. Uh, I am at least, and that's all we had when I was a kid. Never saw a deer tick until I was probably in college. Uh, they just weren't that common, but they are very common now. So, and here you can see a nymph. There you see an engorged adult, which is kind of unpleasant. Uh, wood tick, any kind of tick engorged is pretty unpleasant. So, and you can see they're, they're, they're not very big, not very big. Uh, now, when do we find morels? Well, late April to early June here in Minnesota, depending on what part of Minnesota you're in. The, the what people refer to as grays usually appear uh, early on, uh, right away. And, and they're really the same as yellow morels. They're just really young. And uh, they tend to stay gray just because it's a little cooler in that part of the season. And they get bigger. Uh, you know, you, there's time lapse pictures or series of pictures that people take of how they grow. They don't just instantly appear, not usually. But we find that later in the season, we find, find what we call Bigfoots, which are very large morels. And usually they didn't grow the whole season. They they take about probably 10 days to reach maturity, maybe two weeks. And I find uh, my theory is, is that the Bigfoots that you find at the end of the season, they're just the, some of the last ones to come up. And then they grow really because the weather is so warm and stuff. They grow really fast and get really big in that time. Peak of the season here is usually somewhere around mid-May, and the season is about three to five weeks long. And and you can, to some degree, I mean, there's people who, who follow them. They start finding them in sunny, open areas that face south, and then by the end of the season, you're looking in areas that face north and are maybe in deep ravines or something like that, dense woods where it's really shaded, so it's stayed cool. And so uh, you can kind of stretch your season. Uh, people look and uh, south-facing slopes to begin with, then to west-facing slopes, then east-facing slopes, then north-facing slopes. So they chase them around best they can. Uh, mostly you just find them where they are. There's uh, There's some telltale things that you can see about uh, uh, other indicators in our plant communities. The lilacs being in bloom are a pretty good indicator that if, if you've got, li if the lilacs are in bloom, that is a peak time to be going out and looking for them because because that's a good indication that things have reached the appropriate time. Dandelions beginning to go to seed. Now, people will find them earlier than this, and people will find them late, later than this. But kind of that two weeks when the lilacs are in bloom are, is, is really the prime time to, to make extra efforts. Uh, oak leaves the size of squirrel's ears. Uh, I, I, that's a good one. I don't know what the heck it means. Uh, most of the times, I find my I find my oak leaves to be far beyond uh, squirrel ear size when I 
uh, fine morels. Uh, soil temperatures make a difference. When you're looking at soil temperatures about four inches deep, you want to be, you know, upper 40s to low 50s into maybe 60, it'll keep going. But uh, once it hits fit in the 50s for the soil temperature, uh, usually you'll do pretty good. Another thing is people say that if the, if the, you want nights that are above 50 degrees at night, uh, kind of get some going and stuff. One thing interesting, and we'll see if it makes any difference, is we have almost no frost in the ground this year. It snowed so much early across the whole state, and it never got really long periods of really cold weather, that the frost never went very deep. So my expectations is, is that the, you know, the frost is going to be out of the ground right away, and the ground's going to warm up pretty quick. I don't know how that's going to affect the morales. And, you know, now that the weather's getting nice, there'll be people crawling around looking at them. So we'll be, we'll find out soon enough how it's affecting things. Here you talk about going south slopes, north slope, shaded areas. Very important as, as almost all mushrooms, they're really sensitive to moisture. So it's it's the rain. If 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 we don't get rain at the right times, even though we had lots of snow this year, and the good news is not a lot of frost, so hopefully a lot of the moisture will soak into the ground. But if it gets warm and dry, the morels just don't don't respond very well to that, or they come up and they end up drying out. They just turn into, I mean, if you get really dry, hot, warm weather, I mean, I picked morels that were dehydrated in the ground. I mean, you just, not that you couldn't pick them and eat them, soak them in water. I mean, they were fine. Just they were, they were crispy, um, which was better than spoiled and moldy, but, um, Recently dead or close to dead elm trees are the best. My experience has been that it'll be very few elm trees that are not completely dead. If they have any green sprouts that they're struggling to survive, I've never had much success. I won't say none because morels are kind of fickle and people find them in places that are odd. Uh, I saw and I I saw a posting where a friend of mine's dad took a picture of the the uh, rock that was uh, in the that was landscaping rock at the drive-through of McDonald's, and there's a morel. He was sitting waiting in line at the drive-through, and there's a morel growing out of the rock uh, at the McDonald's. Uh, what the heck it was doing there, I have no idea, but it's a great picture. So, uh, so recently dead or close to dead, if you find the see the elms that have no bark on them at all, or most of the bark is already gone, that's usually not a good sign either. They're they're usually pretty much that tree is pretty much done. Again, I have come across trees that had no bark and there was a whole bunch of morels there, but it was, I've walked up to so many trees that didn't have any bark on them. It, it uh, didn't make up for it. <laughs> so here's what, uh, what elms look like. And a lot of times you're gonna see them, they won't have leaves on them yet uh, in most cases in the spring. And of course the dead ones don't have leaves on them at all. But uh, this gives you an idea what they they look like, a very vase shaped. And sometimes uh, the, our, our most common elm for morels in this area and the best ones are American elms. Now we have other types of elms that grow here. Uh, some of them are native, some of them are not. Um, the Those other elms don't 
usually look quite this vase shaped and they are less likely to die from Dutch elm disease. And so, uh, and my experience is even when they do die, they're less likely to have morels by them. But I have found them by other types of elms as well. But uh, very classic elm shape. Here's some elms. Uh, now, the person that took this picture uh, told me, you know, said that that this was what he thought was a really good elm. And my experience is this would be too far gone. But he found a bunch of morels here. So shows what I know. So uh, uh, that was why one reason he took the picture is to is to show what a what a good elm uh, might look like. I usually like them with a little more uh, bark on uh, than this. This one's getting pretty old. Now, when you when you when uh, you find an elm that has morels by it, you can go back the next year and sometimes find morels and sometimes not sometimes you'll find them for several years after uh they've uh, you first found them when they first died uh and some years you'll find them one year and never see them again so it's kind of a crapshoot that way they also uh like to be they also associate under uh sometimes oak trees sometimes poplars cottonwoods is a good place that to look and the cottonwoods if you look under cottonwoods you want a cottonwood that either is dying or just died or has been damaged somehow uh, I had I had a wonderful patch that I found one year along the Minnesota River where there were a group of cottonwoods that were probably about two feet across, you know, 24 to 30 inches in diameter. And some really ambitious beaver tried to try to take it down, but they only girdled them about a third of the way. And there were tons of morels there and i was all excited about this spot because they didn't they didn't kill the trees and then of course the next year we had record flooding on the minnesota river and i went back there all excited and there was two feet of sand uh, on top of that spot and uh, uh, by the time the things recovered most of the most of the cottonwoods that ended up getting washed into the river because it was right on the river bank. Uh, dead sumac. Now, I've looked at a lot of dead sumac myself, and I have never stumbled across them myself, but I've been with people that said, here they are in the sumac, and sure enough, they were in the sumac. But I've looked at a lot of sumac myself and just never, never had any luck. Apple trees. Old apple trees that are getting sickly, dying, is a good place to consider looking. Uh, and and they, that can be a good spot. Uh, people do find them in really good years. People find them in apple trees in their yards. Uh, I've had several people that said, geez, I found a whole bunch of morels growing under my crab apple tree in my yard. And I'm going, wow, that's really fortunate. It, 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 at the same time, they might only find them there one or two years and then never see, never see them again for ever or for a long while. River bottoms and floodplains are good because they like the moisture and they like soil. They don't like the you know, the soils, they want to be kind of loamy and stuff. So, and river bottoms and floodplains, elms like to grow there because they, they can tolerate the, the moisture. Uh, disturbed ground is a, is a place uh, 
for whatever reason, some people say that uh, railroad tracks can be good, and I have found them on railroad tracks. And they say that maybe the trains going by kind of vibrates the ground and causes them to get going. I, I don't know. But yeah, uh, long railroad tracks can be good. But again, those are areas where historically the area along the railroad track is, is scrubby woods where elms might grow uh, and stuff like that. If you go to northern Minnesota, where you see elms growing is a lot of times along the railroad tracks. I don't know if there's any morels there, but the train spreads the seeds. And so they sprout up along the railroad tracks. What? So, you know, landscaping um, out in California, they have a, spe a species of morels that grows in mulch. And, and it's known to do that. And people find them there regularly. Um, and, uh, and you can uh, find, uh, they also associate with white pine. Now, we don't have a lot of white pine down in this part of the state. But they do have white pine in northern Minnesota and places. And I do know people that find them growing in the white pine in northern Minnesota. But they, they... When we find the other type of morels that we find are black morels, and they're a, they're a totally different species. They do grow in this part of the state. I know somebody who finds them growing. They tend to associate more with aspen, and they associate with aspen in northern Minnesota. Uh, they're an earlier uh, species, so they come before we find the yellows here, if we're finding blacks here. And the blacks in northern Minnesota usually come about exactly the same time that we find yellows here. They're blacks fruiting in northern Minnesota. Hmm. I've never really had much luck in conifers, but people do. And people get find yellows in conifers here, and red pines sometimes. It's all quite, you know, spotty in that case. Uh, burn sites are really good out west. Uh, they're species of the morels that, that grow fabulously. Yes, you have a question. So when it comes to finding morels around places like the railroad track or apple orchards, is there any concern about contamination from things like heavy metals and pesticides? Uh, yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, Mushrooms uh, will concentrate heavy metals. And one of the things about apple trees, if you're looking at old orchards, they were often tree, the, pe the pesticides that were used uh, many years ago contained arsenic. And arsenic's an element, doesn't go away, doesn't deteriorate. And so there's potential for morels to concentrate that arsenic in them. Uh, there's some um, debate about whether organics really end up in mushrooms much at all. And it hasn't been studied very well, but heavy metals definitely has. And so there is a concern about contamination. You know, there's lots of people that they don't like, you know, they don't want to pick mushrooms out of somebody's yard or golf courses or things like that for that very reason. You know, we've seen them along growing along the edge of farm fields where the, the farmer has gone past, you know, spraying herbicide and literally the mushrooms are dripping. That doesn't sound very good. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so so that is a that is a concern that you would have. Um, probably not too many apple orchards because they stopped using arsenic some time ago. It's so different. So we're probably not running across a whole lot of exposure to arsenic anymore. But other heavy metals, um, you know, you could be concerned about. As I was saying, burn sites out west can be, I mean, that's where most, 
most of the commercially available mushrooms come from in the United States is from uh, wildfire birds uh, because they can be, I mean, they can be, have tremendous fruitings where you can pick 50 to 100 pounds of them a day and, uh, and it can be really great. I've, I've not experienced it, but I, I really want to. Uh, we don't seem to get them burn sites here. I did pick some at the Greenwood fire last year. Uh, and it was unclear what they were not the kind of morels that we find in burn sites out west. They were a different species, which have which I have not conclusively identified yet. Uh, but they were growing uh, amongst the pine where the forest fire had been. So. Finding places to hunt, you know, uh, they have atlases of public land. They have apps out there that identify landowners, the DNR websites, you know, park and forest maps, you know, Google Earth. You know, you can go on Google Maps and look at the satellite view. And sometimes you can even see dead elms in the satellite view. But you don't know how long ago those pictures were, were archived. So. Um, scout for good trees when you're driving around. My wife hates that when I'm driving around because I'm looking like this instead of at the road. Haven't gotten any accidents yet, but at the same time, it's, she finds it quite unsettling uh, when I'm craning my head. You know, but no clear locations, and like I say, knock on doors. You know, get to try to see if there's people that'll that'll let you hunt on their property, because there's lots of people that don't. There are some people that do, but I've I've had good luck in that over the years. You know, to to see them. You know, you a lot of times you need to kind of have a low view because they're a little bit under the understory you need to visualize them you know a lot of times you'll be out early in the season and you won't find any you won't find any and all of a sudden you'll see one and all of a sudden you'll look around and all of a sudden they pop out and you just see them easy and whenever you find them always look for more because you know when i go on and the first thing i do when I see a morale as I'm approaching an area where I might expect to see one, as soon as I see one, I don't take a step. I look around to see if I see more. I look around under my feet, make sure I'm not standing on one. And, and I look around and then I go and start picking. And as soon as I kneel down to pick one, I'm immediately looking around at that low vantage point trying to see where they all are and i tend to be very thorough and going through all the area where they are but they're surprisingly camouflaged and uh and they they're partners they have partners that they're friends with that are corn cobs and black walnuts and out of the corner of your eye they will make you think they're a morale until you look right at them and then you go darn because uh, but they they use those for camouflage hmm? yeah yeah and as you can see they can they can really hide here you're seeing one you say how did somebody even spot that well sometimes you're just looking for a little bit you know, just the bare little bit sticking through the grass that you see that kind of honeycomb area or that color or you see the the stem of them, you know, and, and that's what uh, what jumps out at you, you know, and, and allows you to spot them. So those are the kinds of things you need to look for. You see they're, they're tucked in all kinds of different places. And here you see... There's three of them at least there. 
maybe more, maybe even a fourth one. I can't tell. Uh, actually, uh, this is our friend Glenn, who is not here right now. Uh, I hope he's on the thing. I hope you're feeling better, Glenn, because Glenn is the one who uh, has pretty bad case of Lyme's disease right now. Uh, he was feeling better uh, some years ago when this picture was taken. If you see one, there's more. Look at different angles. And we used to have a guy, he used to hunt them, and he said he would, he would see them. He would find as many as he was walking out as when he was walking back because of the different angle. Just a few more. Okay. There's a bunch. Is this your part of it? Yeah, it oh, is. Oh, I'll get on your way. I'm, I'm getting into the mushroom corn. Isn't that a great one? It's the perfect segue. Yeah, there you go. Now John's going to take over. Yes, you have a question. The question is about using canines for, in, yes. Yes, and actually, uh, there's a there's a uh, dog trainer here in Minnesota that uh, has put on a classes for probably the last uh, four or five years in the spring, uh, providing tr to try to teach your dog to uh, find morels, um, and she definitely has had some some dogs that she has worked with that do a good job of finding uh, morels that you hide. Uh, how well they work out in the field is, is uh, I, I've not seen a lot of uh, uh, results from that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add more about the exact what we're talking about. I mean, we've, we've learned how to and stuff, and we, we don't want to take for granted that everybody knows 100% what morels are. We can call this the field of dreams, for lack of anything else. But So that's what we're all looking for in various stages. Um, Science-wise, I'm going to... Very, very quickly, the, the yellow morel, the black morel, and the half-free morel at the bottom of the page, those are the current scientific names, and they may be changing again, but we, we don't know because um, with DNA analysis, we're finding out more and more um, that there may be like 19 or 20 different morels uh, species uh, throughout the United States, worldwide, must could be considerably higher. But as uh, Ron mentioned um, when he was talking about some of the some of the ver various kinds of fungi, um, these are Ascomycota. They're spore shooters. That's what I tend to look at them that way. Whereas most of the mushrooms that we tend to find, the gill and the cap things, those are spore droppers. All right, so those are basidiomycetes. This, these are ascomycetes. They tend to shoot their spores because of the way that they uh, carry them and how they distribute them. And I've seen that actually with morels sitting on my counter where it'll look like they let off a puff of smoke. Um, and it's really kind of cool. Uh, I wish I had a video of it, but I didn't. Um, so again, they're a member of this they're very closely related to these pizizas. There's these cup fungi. Um, so they're spore shooters. And again, this is the classic Morcella Americana. All right. Um, when we actually got the scientific, or, or we got the state mushroom, it was called Morcella escalenta because we didn't know about all the DNA differences, et cetera, et cetera, but it's still the same common one, uh, common yellow morel, but they have, they come in various versions and colors. They're hollow on the inside, extremely, extremely important. All right, so when you're looking for a morel, it's one of the foolproof four for this very reason, because if you actually do a cross section, you can tell that they're hollow on the inside. And that's, that's one of the most important things. You want to do that anyhow when you're cleaning them because sometimes there'll be ants and bugs and dirt and mud and slugs up on the inside. How they get in there, who knows, but they get in there somehow. 
Um, so you may want to clean it out. But you notice that it's pits and ridges, very honeycombed shaped thing on top of a stem, but it's hollow. And in these particular ones, they're connected all the way. The cap is connected the entire way. There's a half free morel, which is only connected halfway, but uh, you'll see that in a minute. That's these guys. So they look a little bit different. They're a lot more stem, much more, uh, much less of a cap. Um, they look a little different, but they, again, they're a, they're a true morel and they're edible. Uh, there's not as much cap there, so there won't be as much flavor to them. Um, but these are a, a common one. I find these actually around cherry trees, black cherries, uh, more frequently. Um, sometimes they're a little bit earlier morel. So you find them maybe a little earlier in the season before you find the others. Um, and they will look like this. That's what they're hollow on the inside. But as you can see, that cap is only connected halfway up. There are true morels. Um, this person who cut this one for the picture took too much of the dirt because I like to make sure that I cut them off like Peter does. But it's more of a very practical aspect of trying to keep the dirt out of my basket. Because all the pits and ridges, they like to hold sand, dirt, mud, bugs, whatever. And it's harder to clean them. Um, so you want to actually keep the dirt out of your basket as much as you can. These are the black morels. Now, when, you, when you're when you talking about black morels, I mean, they pretty much look maybe a little bit more conical, um, but they get their name black morels because the ridges are darker than the pits. Whereas on the other ones that we look at, usually, the, well, I'll find a better picture. Um, the pits, and the ridges will be about the same color on the yellow or the grays, or the ridges are lighter colored than actually the pits. But these and the black morels, and again, these are the ones that tend to be more around um, the aspens and, um, and the pines, more likely to find up north, but we do find them down here too. And uh, one of the features about the black morels is oftentimes there's a slight indentation where the cap connects to the stem. These are furpas. Now these are these are related to the to the morels, um, and we do find the conicas um, on occasion down in southeast Minnesota. Um, I haven't found very many of them, but if one of the things you notice about them, they're called they're nicknamed early morels. They're not true morels. Um, and in places where they have actually morel hunt contests, they count these in their morel counts. But there are some striking differences and the flavor isn't as good. And I would caution you about eating them, but they don't have all this bad stuff in them that some of the other false morels do. Uh, but you notice that if you do a cross section of them, they have like a pithy, uh, a pithy substance inside. So they're not fully hollow. And if you notice the cap, the cap is only connected at the very top of the stem. So it looks like a thimble on top of a stem. And that's where they'll get their, their nickname thimble heads. So. Don't recommend them, but you see them from time to time, um, and they're they're of interest. Um, this is the Verpal Bohemica, which I have never seen one of these in Minnesota. They find them much more frequently in Michigan. Um, I'm not sure about Wisconsin. They look pretty close to some of the half free morels, but those ridges that you see are folds, and they you don't have the pits that are between them as as much. But when you do a cross section, you will also see that it has that cottony substance on the inside of them. These are the ones, the false morels that Ron talked about that you can find sometimes. Um, and they're enormous. A lot of times people will say these are the big meaty morels, but they're not. They're false morels and they do have a chemical in them in various degrees 
It's not across the entire group of gyrometra. Um, some of them have more of the toxin in it than others. It's a systemic toxin. So the caution is this, is that there's individuals, I've given presentations a lot of parts of the, of the state, and you see a kind of a grumpy looking guy with his arms folded when you're talking about you shouldn't eat these. And then he raises his hand eventually, I've been eating these for years. And it's like, okay, well, here's the story I want to tell you. Okay, there's been individuals that have eaten these for years. And then finally, that systemic toxin reaches the tipping point. So that the next meal that they have of this sends them over the edge. So that's what a systemic toxin tends to be. It builds up in your flesh in your liver or whatever, and can cause you problems down the line. Now, in, in Finland and in other places where they have gyrometra, gyrometra in, in large numbers, they do sell it sometimes in grocery stores and that kind of stuff. Well, when they prepare them, it's like, it's like the puffer, puffer fish in Japan, where somebody knows exactly what they're doing and they will boil these things, throw the water away, boil it, throw the water away, boil it, throw the water away. There's no exact science how many times you have to boil it to throw the water away. But they're big and meaty, so it's very tempting. They have a nice, pleasant smell, and they do reportedly taste good. And you can't predict how much toxin is going to be in any given mushroom. That's true of the even deadly amanitas because a tiny one could have more than enough to kill you. A big one may not have enough to just make you sick. So, and they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and most of them are big and meaty and it's all these folds. So there is no pits and ridges to these and they're very chambered on the inside. So when you cut one open, like the one that's on the, I guess that'd be on, on your right, <clears throat> um, they're chambered. You can see they, there's all these various chambers and, and areas inside. If you do a cross section, many of them will be saddle shaped like this. And then again, here's the monomethylene hydrazoline. Uh, <coughs> that's a tox, that's a type of uh, era component of rocket fuel. So it is carcinogenic, supposedly. These are health fellas. Now, these are a little bit different. These are actually maybe more closely related to the truffles. So they're not even, sometimes people will mistake them for morels, but they come at, usually come at a different time of year. Most of the time, these come in late summer to early fall. Um, and as you can see, though, they do have chambers on the inside. They have very fluted stems. Um, some people may eat these. I don't know. I've never been brought to that um, because there's too many other things that I trust. Uh, but these tend to uh, also be called false morels, but they come at a different time most of the time that is not when morels. We get morels in May, maybe early June, sometimes late April, if the weather's just right. If you find what you think is a morel any other time of year, it's a stinkhorn, a false morel, a helvella, it's something else. Um, so um, um, unless there's something out there that I'm not aware of, but morels here, it's a springtime thing. That's why we spend so much time talking about them here. We're tired of winter. We want to get out. We want to find stuff. They taste good. That's why we get out. So th there's a lot of variations. They come in different color shapes. Um, they're almost like snowflakes in that each one can be unique. You know, so some of them have, if you see the one on the far, far right on the bottom, it's got really big pits. And sometimes that can be depending on which tree it's by or whatever. But the variation is it's a little hard to predict. Uh, but there's a lot of variation. So be aware of that. It's not going to always look like the classic morel. Some of them will be very rounded, etc. Um, not all of them will look just classic like this. 
Um, it would be great if they did. Um, that's probably the ideal size, the you know, ideal uh, maturity. There is some concern that if you pick a bunch of gray morels that have not spored yet, that you are hurting the future crop of morels. There is no science that really backs that up. Um, but generally, you can think that you should probably wait a little bit till your morels are bigger. But most of us are hunting in public lands. And if we see a morel, are we going to wait for it to grow later? Because the next person that's right behind us is going to pick the darn thing. So, you know, that's a that's a matter of your own um, intestinal fortitude, and what you want to do. Um, so grays, yellows, same thing. All right. Usually type uh, gray ones are usually grayer because they're more shaded. But that isn't always true. It's not an exact science. And usually a lot of the grays tend to be the smaller ones, the younger ones. And by the time they start to mature, they, they kind of yellow or they pale out a little bit. They're not going to be bright yellow by any means. This isn't like chanterelles where they're bright yellow. They're, they've got a yellowish tanness to them like that. They call it, they call that a yellow maroon. But that's, it's very, it's more tan. And as they get bigger, they get a big base on them. Those are called big foots a lot of times, and they'll start to fall over a little bit. You see like a little rustiness at the very, very tip of that one. Um, that's something that it would be a matter of your choice whether you wanted to kind of trim that off a little bit, but that's a place where it's starting to mature, or it may have got a little frostbite because that happens too. That's one of the realities of morel hunting because one day you could be in the 70s and the next day you're out going to your spot, and it frosted overnight. Um, and, you know, sometimes that raises havoc with the morel crop, and sometimes it doesn't do much to it. It's, it's very unpredictable. Again, more pictures, grays, yellows, very, very similar. Um, yellows can be small, too. They don't have to be big. Now, what is the, what is the whole science behind a morel? Why do morels like dead or recently dead elm trees or some other trees that are diseased? Well, part of the reality, and this is this is debated, debated somewhat too, but part of the reality, it's believed that a morel mushroom is by, a, by and large a symbiotic relationship with those elm trees or white ash trees or cottonwoods or whatever. The mycelium is growing out of sight, out of mind. So stop me if you don't understand that I'm talking mycelium, which is the bulk of the organism, and the morel is just the fruit body. That's the reality. In every mushroom's case, it's that same thing. You got the fruit body and you have the mycelium, which is the bulk of the organism, growing out of sight, out of mind in most cases, and that organism is working in conjunction with the healthy elm trees. And then suddenly Dutch elm disease comes along and is just killing that elm tree. And so the elm tree can't, can't fight it off. It's dying or it's dead. Suddenly the root system, the morels, the mycelium senses that its food source that it's getting sugars in symbiosis with that elm tree, those sugars are being depleted and it's got to get the heck out of here. Well, the mushroom can't walk. All it can do is put up a fruit body and shoot its spores to the next suitable place. So if you look at it like that, it makes much more sense of why dead and dying elm trees. Now there is some evidence that as those roots are dying, that the, that the mycelium comes, becomes more of a saprobic thing or a decomposer as well, that it switches roles. But this is why you get the gigantic fruitings the first year, maybe two years, and then after that, you may never see it again. That's why some of that makes a lot of sense. So just think in terms of that, 
that they're just saying, we're getting, we're getting the heck out of here and we're going to find the next suitable place. So your spots that produce morels year after year after year, it's not under that same exact tree. It's over to the next ones that are going through the life and death stages. So it's just moving around in that particular area. Um, so there are areas that can appear to totally dry up and you never find them again, except for maybe a few years later where it's getting reestablished. So more pictures. Got lots and lots of wonderful pictures of morels. In it, and these are black morels. Hopefully you can see the difference. Okay, that's a, this would be a yellow or a white. You can see that the ridges are very light colored compared to the pits. And this is a black morel, whereas the ridges are much darker than the pits. All right, just some, just some interesting features of morel. Sometimes it can grow like twin heads and stuff. Um, they, there's lots of variations. Or it appears like they're growing like from a common attachment point, like this one. So you've got four or five of them that are growing from here, from one little spot. It's wonderful when that happens. Boy, it's easy picking then. But And you can see you'll have twins and then a third one next to it, like triplets, clusters. So, so nice when you find them in groups like this. But then when you see that, don't go running over to it like Peter said. Stop. As soon as you see that, know that there's some other ones close by. And I don't care how experienced you are, you're going to get morale fever. And you're going to see that first couple of morels, and you're going to go traipse it over there, and suddenly you're going to look and you go, oh, man, I stepped on five or six of them. Or you, you kneel down and you go, wow, they're everywhere. But you have to take your time, be thorough, be thorough, and don't be in a rush. Unless you're in a big group, and then all of a sudden everybody else is traipsing around. They say, just holler, stop. Tell them there's a hornet's nest or something. You know, I mean, whatever lie you can look at. Uh, but it's wonderful when you find them. And yes. Uh, um, and another thing I just wanted to point out, okay, so on that, <clears throat> the middlemost morel in here, you see that white stuff? That's kind of like a mildew um, that gets on them. That's just, it's fine. Just, you know, you cut that out when you go to clean it. Um, you'll see that. You'll see those variations. One of your biggest enemies to morel hunting is a hailstorm. So morels don't put up very well with hail coming, flying down and ripping all the leaves off and everything because it's going to smash your morels too. So that's bad news. Keep an eye on the weather. Um, if you know bad weather is going to be coming in a particular day and you have a spot you wanted to go to, go the day before or something, you know, just at least a look. Because it's sad when you come across a field of Bigfoots that have been ripped apart by hail. Um, some good hauls. I mean, this this can happen. Now is, is the heyday of morelling over. A lot of discussion about that. Dutch elm disease did a dirty. When Dutch elm disease started to ravage all of our boulevard elms and that stuff, morels were everywhere. It wasn't hard to pick a bushel basket full of morels. You could walk up and down Penn Avenue and pick them because all the elms were dying. Now many of them elms have been replaced by other boulevard trees. If it's maples, that's not going to help you very much. If it's white ash, um, maybe it could help. Green ash doesn't seem to help very much. Cottonwoods, that kind of stuff. But the morels can still be found. And there are still elms that are out there that are still thriving. And like Peter said, usually it was the American elms that were the ones that succumbed the first. But I've got a couple of big elms that are actually starting to show signs of disease but every year they keep coming back. And every year I keep looking for morels on them and I don't find a single one. So um, probably right. So a lot of good hauls. I hope this is making, giving you fever. Hopefully take some, take some Advil or something because your fever has to settle down for about three, four weeks here. 
Um, drying morels was talked about. Um, it's one of the best ways to preserve your morels is to dry them. Some people will string them up and actually hang them in the window um, or in a south window. Don't want to hang them out somewhere where animals can get at them because some animals actually like to eat morels. Red squirrels don't trust those little buggers. Um, they like shiitakes, I'll tell you that for sure. Um, you can air dry them on screens or mesh. I use a dehydrator. Don't use it on a high temperature, though. It'll burn your morels. That being said, you need to cook your morels before you eat them. So whatever you're going to do, however you preserve them, if it doesn't involve cooking, you probably need to remember that. So when you just dry them, does that count as cooking? I don't think it does. Not quite enough. So when you rehydrate them, rehydrate them in maybe you know, hot water, but you're going to, you need to cook them. You need to cook morels, especially because there are some toxins. Toxin is a general term saying things we don't digest very well, not necessarily meaning poisons, but the cooking process really makes morels much more palatable for us. Some people, some of your good friends are allergic to morels and some of them are mushroom hunters. So take them with you because they can't keep them, because they can't eat them. And they know this. So um, convection oven can be used. Um, again, don't leave them outside overnight because they're gonna disappear. So that's at a campsite, you could do that. And some pictures of some morel things. This is the tiniest morel I've ever seen. And it's, Looks like a wart on Ron's nose. Um, so, and then there's giant ones. So these are all pictures that have shown up in various publications. This one is actually, was an MMS person. And that is for real. They can be that big. And that was actually found in a window well in St. Paul. Yeah. So, you know, never give up. You can find them. So, so you may stumble upon a morel anywhere. And there's lots of other mushrooms. 